Good evening. Thank you for tuning in to Zion's Banner this evening. Um, as you are aware, Dr. Cran is still unconscious and in, in the ICU. So we're reusing a video he did about two years ago on the Advent and Hanukkah seasons. I uh, just want to make you guys aware, unfortunately, due to time constraints, no one from the family will be available to to read comments as things are going. Uh, feel free to post any questions, email us. Um, they, right now we're using video at cranclan.com for any, any of this stuff. So feel free to ask any questions. A family member will get back to you. Um, also, please keep in mind, this video is a bit older. It's not quite up to the standard of what uh, Dr. Cran's doing now as far as production quality. So just bear that in mind. Uh, the family's done the best they can uh, editing in and, and remastering this uh, using a PowerPoint that Dr. Cran had made. Uh, thank you all for your prayers. The family really appreciates it. And just please continue to bear with us as we try to to learn and, and figure out how to keep Dr. Craig's ministry going while he's incapacitated. Uh, just please be praying and enjoy the video. It's an absolutely amazing confluence of events. Advent is always one of my favorite times every year. Uh, I love the lights in the darkness. I love the feel of the season. So you have a Jewish kid who loves Advent, but it's also the first night of Hanukkah. What, a, what an interesting confluent of events, and what we're going to see tonight is that the two are actually tied in very closely together. So it's very Jewish, and if you love Advent, you should love Hanukkah, and if you love Hanukkah, you should love Advent. Our take-home truth is to fulfill his twofold mission Messiah must come through the Jewish people and be able to represent the Gentiles also. So we're going to see how that works this evening. There. Probably one of the most Jewish books in the Bible is the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to be jumping around a little bit, but I'm going to have you turn there. Now, you can use electronics, or you can use the good old-fashioned analog way of reading your Bible. <laughs> but if you look at Matthew 1.1, 1, 1, you will see the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, son of David, son of Abraham. Jesus is, Yeshua is, forever identified with the Jewish people, and Matthew plays on this identification. And we're looking at one of the Advent accounts here, um, and the most Jewish of the Advent accounts, and we see it starts out right with this genealogy because Matthew is all designed around demonstrating that Jesus is the true king of Israel, and so you start with this genealogy, and so we see right from the beginning that Jesus is identified not just with humanity but with the Jewish people, being a son of Abraham, the father of the Jewish people, and a son of David of the kingly line. But you might say, well, that was while he was um, on earth. The interesting thing is we need to pay attention to the fact that Jesus, Yeshua, is forever eternally or forever identified with the Jewish people. Now, where do I get that from? Well, I'm going to take you from Matthew, which is the first of the Gospels, and the first book in the normative order of the New Testament, as appears in most English Bibles, to the last book in the Brit Hadasha, the New Covenant, to show you that not only is Jesus identified with the Jewish people at his incarnation when he came and he visited this planet, but he is identified with the Jewish people Okay, uh, not, not, he's also identified with the Jewish people not only in his advent, but he's identified with the Jewish people Forever. So if you turn to Revelation chapter 4, let me give you the background here. There's a transition from Revelation chapter 3 to chapter 4. It's a very important transition. 
Chapter 3 deals with real live churches when John was writing. They may be representative of churches throughout history, but they're real live churches that John is writing to. But four transitions, if you look at Revelation 4.1, it says after these things, these are the things in chapter 3, chapter 2, and chapter 1, I looked and behold a door standing open in the heaven and the first and the first voice which I heard was like the voice of a trumpet speaking with me, saying, come up here and I will show you the things that must take place after this. What we're seeing here is the scene changes to heaven, and you need to be aware of that. The scene in chapter 3 and 2, actually chapters 2 and 3, is on earth. Chapter 4 transitions the scene to heaven. So this is in heaven. That's so important to keep track of. And the picture continues uh, as far as being in heaven in chapter 5. And so when you get to chapter 5, 5, we end up reading these words here. And you can be looking at your Bible. And one of the elders said, Do not weep. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose the seven seals. Now, what I'm getting at here is not only is Jesus identified with the Jewish people in his coming and visiting on earth through birth and identified not just with humanity but with the Jewish people, but he is forever identified with the Jewish people because this scene takes place in heaven. He has been glorified. It is not on earth anymore. It is not this first visit. It is not his visiting through what's called the virgin birth, the incarnation. This is forever. This is him in his glorified body. And he is identified as the root of David and the lion of the tribe of Judah. That means he is forever in a glorified Jewish body. That's what's so important. So often when we look at Advent, we get the whole story. And the fact that Jesus was born and came and walked among us is, is always talked about, but the fact that Jesus is identified with the Jewish people, not only at the time of Advent, but forever, is often ignored by the church. Jesus is forever identified with the Jewish people in a glorified Jewish body. He is identified as the root of David. That's clearly a Jewish reference. He is identified as the lion of the tribe of Judah in his glorified state up in heaven. And so we need to see that, remember, our, our take-home truth is that given Messiah's twofold mission, he must be identified with the Jewish people. And he must come through the Jewish people, but he must also be able to be identified not only with the Jewish people, but with the Gentiles. And so we need to see that. Now, I didn't give you Messiah's twofold mission, did I? No. <laughs> but you need that. You need Messiah's twofold mission. If you're going to understand the work of Jesus and what Jesus wants to see, you need to see Messiah's twofold mission. And that's given in Isaiah. Isaiah 49 6 gives us Messiah's twofold mission. Indeed, he says, speaking to Messiah, it is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel, but I will make you as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. That is the twofold mission of Messiah. Now we've seen that in order to fulfill that twofold mission, the first thing we saw is that Messiah has to be identified with the Jewish people, and he is eternally identified with the Jewish people. But how is he going to bring salvation to the ends of the earth and be a light to the Gentiles? if he cannot identify with the Gentiles. So he must come through the Jewish people and be identified with them, but he must also be able to identify with the Gentile nations. So how is that going to work, we ask ourselves. Which leads to another question, because that's the best way to do things in a Jewish manner, is to answer a question (laughs) with a question. So our next question is, how many Gentile women does it take to make a Messiah? And we're going to look at that genealogy back in Matthew. So you can turn back to Matthew... And we're going to be spending time in that genealogy, which is so apropos for this time of year, but but really is very apropos for Hanukkah too, because Messiah is God's servant to restore the preserved ones of Israel and be the light of the world, even as the Messiah candle 
or the servant candle lights the other candle so that there is light in the darkness. And so you're going to go back to this very Jewish book called Matthew, which is not a Gentile book at all, but a terribly Jewish book. And as you start reading down the genealogy, you have that basic headline, son of Abraham, son of David. That's a summary statement. And then you have the genealogy that backs up that Jesus is a son of Abraham and a son of David, and that much more. And you get to verse 3, and you see that Judah begat Perez and Zara by Tamar. Perez begot, and then you see the next name, and then the next name, and then the begot. We're going to focus on the fact that Judah begot Perez and Zara by Tamar. Now, you would expect to find Jewish women in a royal genealogy for the king of Israel, wouldn't you? The Messiah, the one who is expected by the Jewish people. But what you wouldn't necessarily expect is to find a name that is not Jewish. You know, it's so funny. It's shock for the church to understand that Jewish people follow Messiah today and should follow Messiah and can come to faith. But the shocking thing is that when you read the genealogy of Matthew and in the time of Jesus, the shocker was that Gentiles could come to faith. <clears throat> and so that's where we see ourselves. So we need to get to know this gal Tamar. Um, she is a Canaanite. One of the people from the land of Canaan, now she's actually given a specific uh, title here as we look at her, um, the question as to who the Canaanites were and who the Abdulites, she's hanging out in Cana, she's technically given a name from the family that she's from, but let's just be real clear, she's not a nice Jewish girl from Brooklyn, all right? We need to understand that. She was originally the wife of Judah's firstborn son. Which leads us to a strange case because, wait a minute, she's the wife of Judah's firstborn son, but Judah begat sons through Tamar. How does this end up working? This is sort of like the song, I am my own grandfather. <laughs> but Tamar is the strange case of being widowed and leave a right marriage. So we need to discuss this. When we look in Genesis 38, 6, and you can take a second to, to, to get a feel for it. We have this whole story around Tamar and Judah. It seems like an interruption in the flow of the text. But it's really a very important story because it's, it, it's picked up here in Matthew and it's picked up in other genealogies. And I don't think it's an accident. I think it's also showing us a change in Judah's character from when he sold Joseph he still isn't quite there character-wise yet. God's still doing character training with Judah because that's the line that Messiah is going to come from. And so there's continued character training in Judah's life. And we have this strange story of Tamar. When you get to 38 verse 6, and I trust by now that you have a, a smart enough smartphone that you've been able to run your finger through it and get there. <laughs> a Judah took a wife for... I'm going to... I don't have the Hebrew, so I'm going to use the transliteration. I know it's the 11th plague, but you have to deal with it. Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. So this is how she enters the family. Now, we're working on our next step, which is to get the PowerPoints in. So eventually you'll be able to see the PowerPoints with the cool charts. Uh, but, but Ur did wickedness in the sight of the Lord, and God ends up taking his life, which leaves Tamar in a problem because... Because Ur or didn't have any children. So now you have a line in Judah that, that didn't have any children. And the custom was that a brother could marry the widow of his brother and raise up a line for him. Leave a right marriage. That's enshrined in Mosaic law later, but it was allowable at the time. And so Judah says to Onan, go to, into your brother's wife and marry her and raise up an heir to your brother. And so that's Judah's plan at the beginning here. And then, but Onan knew that the heir would not be his. See, the heir would be his brother's heir, not his. That means that his line would get less. His heirs would get less. And so that's a little problematic, and Onan doesn't like the idea that his kids are going to go ahead and lose out. And so he knew that that would happen, and so he went into his 
brother's wife, but he made sure she wouldn't get pregnant. Now, the description is, is a little bit graphic. The Bible doesn't mind uh, being a little bit clear about things. But rest assured, he practiced a very ancient form of birth control, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend. But, but God was not pleased with the selfishness of Ur's motives. And so God ended up uh, eliminating him. Now, we, we have the same problem here. Tamar is a widow again. I mean, she marries one of Judah's kids and he dies. Okay, and there's this whole story around how she ends up having a line. Now, I, I have a cool chart here, and, and our next step is going to be to go ahead and include the PowerPoints in the presentations that I'm doing, um, courtesy of Facebook. Um, but the neat thing about this is it shows the whole line. What ends up happening is Tamar needs to have uh, children. So she does some, and don't do this at home. This is one of those Bible stories where you, you, don't, you don't do this at home. But she dresses up like a prostitute and she gets Judah to end up uh, basically uh, going in and spending time with her. And uh, she becomes pregnant. And of course, Judah thinks that uh, his daughter-in-law has been playing the harlot, but she has requested from him a cord and his staff as identifying marks until he could pay her properly. Uh, and then she disappears, and he goes back to pay her, but see, she isn't around. But now she's got his staff. So she, she's got him by the name card here. She's got him by his driver's license. And so when he goes to go ahead and deal with her and uh, put this evil away, she says that I am pregnant by the man who owns these things. And then she shows the staff. It's like whipping out the guy's driver's license saying, this is the guy who did the deed. Okay. And thus, Judah ends up having children through Tamar. Now, remember what we said. Jesus is forever identified through the Jewish people. He came through the Jewish people. And so, but he also has to be able to identify with the Gentiles. And why can he do that? Because there are Gentiles in his line. So he can be identified with the Jewish people, but he can be identified with the Gentiles so that he can fulfill his twofold main, uh, mission to be a light to the Gentiles and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. So, we see Tamar. Now, she's, she's not Jewish, and she's not from the right side of the tracks. Okay? And uh, it takes about three months, and Judah goes through this whole thing. Now, that's, that's Genesis. Um, we're going through... Uh, before verse 24 all the way to uh, 26 where uh, she ends up exposing Judah and says this is the guy um, and he has children by her uh, but after he's had children and the Leverite thing is over he doesn't know her again and so this is kind of the way this works. Now is she the only Gentile woman in the line? No, there are several Gentile women in the line of Messiah the next one that we end up reading about is Rahab. Now, she's definitely not royal lineage material here, okay? And we find her all the way in Joshua when they're entering the land. So you're going to be going to Joshua chapter 2. We're going to talk a little bit about her. We're going to tie this all together here. But what I want you to see is we established right from the beginning that Jesus is forever identified with the Jewish people. Uh, we're now established that he can represent the Gentiles, and we've seen the first Gentile woman that would allow for that, but, but his, his genealogy contains more than one. Uh, by the way, if the rabbis are correct about Jewishness being through the mom only, King David isn't Jewish. Mm -hmm. Okay, Solomon isn't Jewish, because see, we're seeing these Jewish women in the genealogy here, before we get to King David, Tamar predates King David. Rahab's going to predate King David. And so when you turn to Joshua 2, they're entering the land, and we read about Rahab in verses 1 and 2. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, uh, sent out two men from the Acacia Grove to spy out secretly, go into the land, especially Jericho. And they went in, and they came to the house of a harlot named Rahab, and they lodged there. 
So what do we learn about Rahab? Okay, she's the next uh, means by which God can identify with the Jewish people. Uh, we learn that she's a Canaanite. They had entered Canaan, right? Mm -hmm. We also learn that she's a prostitute. And the Hebrew word is very clear there. Zonah, it, it's very clear. She was not an innkeeper. I, I guess some liberals that like to, to uh, try to um, get around this, make Rahab just kind of like a waitress. <laughs> um, it's clear. Now, there is a point that, they, that, that, yes, she was in charge of lodging, but the indication from the Hebrew word is that maybe there was a little bit more than just giving the keys to the room at the Holiday Inn. <laughs> Okay, so God is not picking the, the queens of the Gentile nations here either. Um, and so we get introduced to Rahab. But, but Rahab came to faith, and this is what we need to see. Joshua, uh, if you go down to verse 8 through 12, there's this incredible statement of faith by Rahab. I know the Lord has given you the land that the terror of you has fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of the Jordan. That's the area known as Bashan. That's the Golan Heights area. Mm. Okay. Um, and, of course, they're named. One of their names is Og. It sounds like something out of like Sesame Street, like one monster named Og. <laughs> Um, who you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted and there did not remain any courage in us because of you. Now listen to this statement of faith. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth below. Okay? So Tamar ends up being in the genealogy and she ends up raising up part of the line of Messiah. And Messiah can identify through the Gentiles through her, but also through Rahab. Um, and so we see that also, and we see Rahab's deliverance here. Uh, by the way, it goes further uh, in verse 12 and on, Therefore swear by the Lord, since I have shown you kindness, that you will show kindness to my, my father's household, and give me a true token, and spare my father and my mother and my brothers, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. And the men say, uh, Our lives are yours if none of you tell this business of ours, uh, when the Lord has given us the land, we shall deal kindly and truly with you. And so they keep their word, and we see Rahab's deliverance, uh, but we see her background. So we've got two women now, right? right? We've got Messiah forever identified with the Jewish people, being a son of Abraham and a son of David, which is established clearly in the very Jewish Gospel of Matthew. We see, however, that he's forever identified with the Jewish people. So he has to come through the Jewish people to end up being born. And he's forever identified with them. Um, and he's also as Gentiles in his line, so he can identify with them. And we've seen two of them. Um, her deliverance actually ends up coming when they go into the land. But she's promised that deliverance in two. She experiences in chapter 6, 17 through 19... Uh, where Joshua says the city is doomed to destruction. That means you destroy everything. All it and those who are in it. Only Rahab the harlot shall live and those who are with her in her house because she hid the messengers. So when you look at 6, that's the actual event. But the promise is before that event and it's going to happen. Now good old Ruth. Now that's where I'm doing my devotions right now. I decided to read through the Kituvim, the writings. Um... This is an incredible book. I could almost spend time on Ruth because there's so much that's missed when people go through the book of Ruth. The first thing that's missed is the time that this occurs. This is no accident. Mm -hmm. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land and certain man of Bethlehem, Judea, or Judah, went to dwell in the country of the Moabites. He and his wife and his two sons. Uh, and, of course, one of those daughter-in-laws is Ruth. Uh, the reason there was a famine in the land is this is during the time of the judges, and Israel was being disobedient mm -hmm. during the time of the judges. It says it was a time when every man did what was right in his own eyes, and that's always a disaster. 
And so God said when Israel disobeyed, there'd be famine, and there is. And so um, you have this funny thing with the names, but this family, which includes Naomi, ends up leaving Bethlehem of Judea, the territory of Judah, and ends up going to dwell in the land of Moab, uh, one of Lot's uh, descendants, and uh, ends up, uh, the sons die. I always get a kick out of this because the man's name is essentially God is my king. The sons mean sort of sickly and spent, and they die. So whenever I read sickly and spent died, I just about want to plot with laughter because of the way Hebrew names work. But they die, and of course Ruth uh, ends up being of a different character than the other daughter-in-law. And so Naomi survives her sons, and then she's got a thing with the daughter-in-laws. And she tells them, look, I can't provide for you more sons. I'm an old woman. How shall I end up providing for you? And so Ruth decides to stay. Now what I love is, we actually use this in our wedding, because my beloved bride is my Ruth. She really is acculturated to my people, and she's followed me through ministry. And, and let's face it, maybe during the summer, uh, Phoenix starts to look a little bit like the desert in, in Moab. So that's just kind of the way things are. And Ruth says, entreat me not to leave you or turn back from you, following after you. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. That's highly significant. And when you die, where you die, I will die. And where you are buried, I will be buried. The Lord do to me and more also, if anything but death parts you from me. That's that's kind of a, a big thing here. But but Ruth is Ruth is a Moabitress. Okay, so you, you've got this Abdulite or Abdulitress. I don't know how you put that there. Uh, you you have a Canaanite. Now you have a Moabite. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so of course uh, Ruth. Uh, ends up being redeemed. Now, the, the term that's used over and over again in Ruth is the term goel. It means kinsman redeemer. Uh, and that's a highly significant term in terms of Messiah. But it says that Moa, uh, Ruth the Moabitress, notice the text still calls her a Moabitress. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've heard rabbis do things with, well, she, you know, she converted. Well, she converted to the one true God, but she didn't necessarily... Uh, become a physical descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She was a descendant of Lot, and so she's still a Moabitress. Mm -hmm. I have acquired as my wife, this is Boaz, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. This is a Leverite marriage. So that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate, you are my witnesses. And so Ruth through Moabite, uh, through Leverite marriage, enters the line of Messiah. Now, now what we've seen here is Messiah has a twofold purpose. He is to restore the preserved ones of Israel, or to restore Israel to her place before God, and he is to be a light to the Gentiles. And in order to do that, he needs to be identified with Israel. And he came through Israel and is forever identified with Israel. So that, that part of his purpose statement and our take-home truth is true. And he must be able to identify with the Gentiles. And we've seen that there are Gentile women in his genealogy so he can identify with the Gentiles. So, so let's put this in some perspective here as far as our application. First of all, I like to point out that the church, shame on the church for not being involved in Jewish missions. Whether churches are planted or not, shame on them if they're not. Jesus is, I, I look for the day when, when those who have not had some sort of connection to Jewish evangelism face a Messiah in a glorified Jewish body and explain to him why they didn't think that was a worthwhile venture. Because I think they're not going to be as comfortable as they think they might be. Mm -hmm. But let's give another application here. Okay. He's the only way that you'll find peace. Now, the reason I picked that application is because in Luke, a man named Simeon says something very significant. He was promised he would not die until he saw the Lord's Messiah. Lord, 
Now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared before the face of all people, a light of revelation to the Gentiles. See how that sounds like Isaiah 49? Mm -hmm. A light of uh, revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And so Simeon finds peace, and Messiah is the only way that you'll find peace, whether you're a Jew or a Gentile. And so you see the Hanukkah, which preserves the Jewish people, the, the, the incident of Hanukkah, which preserved the Jewish people, fits perfectly because Messiah must come through the Jewish people and he's identified with the Jewish people. But it ties in beautifully to Advent when he shines brightly as the Savior of the world. And so we see both. And so Hanukkah and Advent are tied because Messiah has a twofold purpose. And it relates to both groups. So I'm glad for everybody that tuned in and I'm glad for those that will see it delayed on Facebook. And excited that you could join us. The study will also be loaded on www.zionsbanner.org for you to download. And if you missed a part or the resolution frazzed, that's okay. You can get it there and you can be back again with us in the near future when we broadcast again. Thank you and good evening.